Thank you. You may be seated. Now, I do hope that you read the inserts that get placed in your bulletin each week, the one that's in there today, that first article. Some of you were at the youth rally a couple of years ago when it was here at uh, Bible Presbyterian Church, and um, we were talking about animals in the Bible, and I preached that Sunday on uh, the Lion of the tribe of Judah, and I gave, as one of the illustrations in that message, the uh, lions at Savo in Africa as they were building the cross-continental railroad and uh, how they kept killing people and eating people and actually stopped that lion project. That is the picture of the guy who killed them. That uh, John Henry Patterson there that's on the front with the mule teams and so on like that. It tells you how uh, 1898 English engineer John Henry Patterson was sent to Kenya to build a bridge over the Tsavo River. But two ferocious lions were terrorizing and eating his workmen. Patterson hunted them down and killed them both, enabling the bridge to be completed. The hides are on display at the Field Museum in Chicago today. You can see those two lions. They don't look like the lions. Uh, they, they actually put out a movie on this, and they had the lions with the big, long manes. These are maneless lions, <laughs> a different different breed of lions. Very, very dangerous, and uh, but it's an exciting film anyway. Um, and we encourage you to read that article because he was very, very pro-Israel. Uh, an incredible man and uh, did a lot um, in that cause. Then you have probably heard our president on various occasions, beginning at Thanksgiving, talk about how much the Muslims have contributed to the United States uh, and all the things that we owe them because of all their contributions to the United States. This article here is actually from the Library of Congress, uh, one of the uh, librarians at the Library of Congress. He's a manuscript specialist for early American history and the manuscript division of the Library of Congress. And he points out that that is absolutely not true. He's in charge of the Jefferson Papers. And he talks about how Thomas Jefferson decided we're going to stand up to them and not Mickey Mouse around. And as a result, we've had peace until our current time that we're living in right now because our country's not doing what our founding fathers did. I encourage you to read that. I've also put that article that you see on the back page, on the bottom half of the back page, in before several weeks ago. Remember it, folks. We have a, an election that is coming up that may mean the death of our country. Read it. You count. If you're not registered to vote, do it. Vote in the primaries, not just in the general election, in the primaries. Our country stands at a crossroads. We're going to talk a little bit about that today. And what can you do about it? How can you be prepared for it? But read those articles. I don't put these in simply because I want to waste paper and ink or because the bulletin doesn't look fat enough. They're there for your edification. Please read the things that I put into the bulletin and then pray about what God would have you to do. All right, now let's take our Bibles and turn back to that <coughs> excuse me, passage in the book of Exodus. We're in Exodus chapter 12. Today we're looking at verses 34 through 39. I'm going to summarize just a little bit here at the beginning because it gives us some background as to why what happened did happen. Last week, you remember that we gave some initial observations that God fulfilled his prophetic word precisely, exactly, completely to the letter and not allegorically, symbolically, mythologically, partially, haphazardly, or imprecisely. That applies, folks, to today and what's going on in the United States and what goes on in biblical prophecy. Like he did it back then, he's doing it right now. Now, he will do it someday. He's doing it right now. I hope you pay attention to the way in which it's taking place. That's the way God always fulfills prophecy and how he will fulfill the prophetic future as recorded in Revelation, Daniel, and elsewhere in the Bible. We saw that there are at least eight foundational observations on our text last week. Sometimes it takes death that is close to you to get your attention and obedience. Who do you love? Who could die? You know that hymn we sang just a moment ago, Jesus Calls Us, has my name in it three times. That was one of the hymns the week before Judy died. Tomorrow is the second anniversary of her death. Do you love me more than these? I can hardly sing it with a dry eye. 
What do you love most of all? Do you know God can take it at any moment? Do you really believe that? Number two, sometimes it takes the fear of your own death to get your attention and obedience. Are you afraid of death? Do you know it might come to you today? Number three, sometimes it takes death to realize the sovereignty of God and that he wants you want his blessing and not his curse. Pharaoh got pushed to that point. He wanted God's blessing. Last thing he said to Moses and Aaron before they went out, and bless me also. He soon changed his tune, but he at least got pushed to that point at one point. Number four, sometimes you'll be driven to panic at the most inconvenient times. And we're going to talk about that because the inconvenient time is coming very soon here, folks. Because you didn't obey when you had the opportunity in the good times. Number five, when judgment falls, it will hit your family. It will hit you economically. It will hit you personally. Number six, when judgment falls, there will be no place to hide, not even in prison. Even the firstborn of the prisoners in jail were killed. When judgment falls, it hits the highest of the lowest. There's no respect of persons. Folks, if it comes to the United States, it won't matter what your job is, where you happen to be located, where you think you are economically, where you think you are politically, where you think you are strategically, where you think you are in terms of this world. There's no respect of persons. God makes that clear in Scripture. In fact, that's stated many times. Number eight, when judgment falls, you will not try to cut a deal with God. You will obey in everything required without argumentation. Pharaoh didn't argue this last time. And he obeyed in everything exactly like God said, because God doesn't cut deals. Judgment fell, and it was too late to do anything but to obey. The way for judgment to fall and ravage the price of a pound of flesh closest to your heart. Obey now when you have the chance. Now we've just finished looking at the plague of darkness and the plague of the death of the firstborn, judgmental blindness, blindness followed by death. And I think, as you've heard me say many times now, that I think <clears throat> that the United States is on the cup of the death of the nation. That means that we as believers here in the United States will probably have to suffer very soon. Now, you're probably sitting saying, yeah, yeah. Past pastor's just trying to get our attention. You're right. I'm trying to get your attention. The question is, then, does our text for today give any hints as to what you should do about it in preparation? I hope you pay attention to that. I'm going to give you at least five things today that need to be done. I'm telling you in advance what I'm going to tell you, and I will tell you after I've told you what they are. <laughs> um, you know, I like to repeat a lot because things don't tend to sink in. But our text gives some hints as to what we need to do about it. As I said last week, it appears that the upcoming election is the latch that will open the gate for the lions to eat the Christians in the arena. Of course, the grace of God can still intervene if God's people repent. It's a rather important key. If you don't admit that you've done something wrong, you'll never repent. As long as you stonewall, as long as you harden your heart, as long as you give excuses, as long as you pretend that you've done everything right, you'll never repent. But God sees through excuses. Anything could happen. God can do anything he wants, including removing America from the stage of history. So our issue is to stop worrying and to start repenting. Today I want to bring a few key hints in the text that tell us what to do to be prepared either for blessing or for national judgment. I'll talk about that more in a minute. But first, let's remember the rule that we've already established. If we follow God's instructions with precision, we're going to see some with precision stuff in our text today. If we follow God's instructions with precision, we will have his blessing. That's a basic rule. I think we've established that well. 
We've seen many, many illustrations of it all the way through from the very beginning of the first plague where God sent Moses to Egypt and Moses didn't want to obey and Moses nearly killed him in the wayside. And then finally he obeyed, even after he gave all of his crummy excuses about how he couldn't speak and God told him, I made your tongue. Quit babbling. Precise obedience. If we're sloppy or disobedient about following the instructions, we'll pay for it. But you know, once you learn that lesson, you have to keep doing it. Pharaoh finally learned that lesson of exact obedience. We saw that in our text without trying to negotiate a deal with God, but he forgot it as soon as he had learned it because he chased the Jews to the Red Sea. <laughs> That's coming up. He didn't have a very good memory or very good retention of what had happened. He was so proud, so arrogant, that after he had passed his crisis moment, he got back in the saddle with his chariot, 600 of them, and headed out for the Red Sea to chase the Jews. You see, intellectual believing is not enough. The issue is, how do you respond by action to the truth that you know in your head? Pharaoh was shocked. He was crushed into letting Israel go, but he soon got over his shock. He armed his 600 chariots. I want you to notice something else about immediate obedience, too. In the text today, where they pack everything and head out, if the Jews had not obeyed immediately, they would still be slaves in Egypt today because it didn't take Pharaoh very long to get his act together again and go after them. If they said, well, we'll wait a week while we pack things and organize and sort things out and, you know, we better check things out and sell our houses here because we want to get some money for the place we're living in. If they had done that, they'd still be slaves in Egypt today. You see, obedience means response by immediate action. Obedience is not talking about it. Obedience is not thinking about it. Obedience is not putting it off. Obedience is immediate action. Last week we applied that principle to practical family life with the question, what happens to a child who knows the truth, babbles it with his mouth, but does not obey it or do it? And the text I read to you is Hebrews 10, starting in verse 23. I'm going to read it again because I have some more things to say about it. Let us hold fast the profession. In other words, profession is what you say with your mouth. So here's a guy who knows it. Here's a guy who talks about it, but he hasn't done it. That's the mouth. The profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promised. Now, had God made a promise to Israel? Had he told them, I'm going to lead you out with a high hand out of Egypt? Yes, he said that to them. That was back at the very beginning. He told that to Moses, told that, told that to the children of Israel. The children of Israel at first were all excited about that. Remember back to those first lessons where Moses first shows up in Egypt and goes to Pharaoh. God made them a promise. He is faithful that promised. God has made us some promises. He is faithful that promised. And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works. Yeah, learning to love one another. Boy, that's a toughie. But not merely to love, but to good works. You know something? That's action. That's not talk. That's action. That's not thinking about it. That's action. That's not setting plans for someday in the future. That's action now. Remember, obedience means response by immediate action. Ah, and then the point of the passage. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is. In other words, there were people there who liked to cut church too. That means going to church. That means going to church even when going to church is tough. Did you know that when the book of Hebrews was written and the Romans were invading the land, that was a really tough thing to do. The Jews hated them. The Romans hated them. Everybody hated them. They wanted to kill them. If they could catch them, they would kill them. So, hey, if they caught a whole group of them together, that was really exciting. They could crucify a whole bunch of them at once, or they could cut them all up with swords all at once. That was written when it was tough to go to church. Someday, folks, it's going to be tough to go to church. What's your excuse now? Exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. Is the day approaching? 
Mm -hmm. Verse 26. For if we sin willfully, that's in the context of skipping church. If we sin willfully, you know you're supposed to do it, but you don't. You have an excuse. If we sin willfully, after that we have received the knowledge of the truth, in other words, you know it, <clears throat> but you're not doing it, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins. There's not something you can add to it to overcome willful sin. Is there any willful sin in your life? Things you know that you should be doing that you're not, or things you know you shouldn't be doing that you are doing. Where you've been stubborn, and you've said, I'm not going to do that. I don't care what anybody says about it. I'm going to be stubborn. I'm going to do my own will. <clears throat> Folks, that's willful sin. What happens to people who do that? Verse 27. But a certain fearful looking for of judgment and fiery indignation. We've been talking about that, haven't we? Judgmental blindness. We've been talking about the judgment that landed on the land of Egypt. We talked about the ten different plagues that hit Egypt. You know, children of Israel are going to experience some of that too. The hand of God when they get into the wilderness and start to bellyache and complain and murmur and groan about the leadership that God has given them. He's going to kill them. You need to understand that. A certain fearful, certain fearful looking for of judgment and fiery indignation which shall devour the adversaries. It's not only the adversaries, it can hit you too. He that despised Moses' law died without mercy under two or three witnesses. There we are, back in the wilderness wanderings, children of Israel, leaving land of Egypt, Exodus. He's applying it to us. Look at verse 29, of how much sorer punishment, you mean worse than that? Worse than being out in the wilderness and getting stoned to death? Without mercy? Of how much sorer punishment, suppose ye, shall he be thought worthy? In other words, ye deserve it. Now that's written in the age of grace. That's not written in the age of the law. That's written in the age of grace. That's written post-cross. That's written post-resurrection. Shall he be thought worthy? And listen to what... And he's been talking about, you know, lackadaisical attitudes toward church. And this is what he says about that. He says, Who hath trodden underfoot the Son of God. Whoa. Hath counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he is sanctified an unholy thing. Whoa. That's in the context of a give it or take it, leave it up to my emotions how I feel about it attitude about church. And hath done despite unto the Spirit of grace. He's talking about punishment under grace. That's what happens to you when you cut out a church for your own petty carnal reasons. Now, folks, that doesn't just apply back to the Jews in Jerusalem when the Romans surrounded the city in 70 AD. That's written for us. For we know him that hath said... Vengeance belongeth unto me, I will recompense, saith the Lord. God doesn't say, well, you know, I might listen to your excuses and say, well, that was a pretty good excuse, uh, so we'll scratch that one off. And, well, that week, that, that was a pretty good excuse, too, so I'll scratch that one off. I will recompense, saith the Lord. And again, the Lord shall judge all the heathen out there, right? Is that what it says? The Lord shall judge? Okay, you've said it, you know it. It's in your head. It's been in your ears. The Lord shall judge His people. His people. That's the elect. That's us. That's the church. That's those who have believed on the Lord Jesus Christ and have been saved. The Lord shall judge His people. Verse 31. But it really won't be too bad, says God. Is that what verse 31 says? It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. 
Do you believe that? I sure hope you do. So we asked some application questions. What excuses do you give to God? Now I'm talking about excuses you give to God. Not excuses that you give to yourself. Not excuses you give to your family. Not excuses that you give to the pastor. Not excuses that you give to other people. What excuses do you give to God for missing church or being perpetually late? People, it's my job to point out sin that I see in the church. You can hate my guts for it, but that's what a preacher is called to do. I don't tickle your ears like some of the guys on TV. My goal is to see you grow in Christ. My goal is to see you win heavenly rewards. My goal is as much as possible to lead you in the truth, to see it change your life. Because I love you. And I want the best for you. Just like my little kids didn't believe that when I was disciplining them as they grew up. They now know it's true. The point of Hebrews 10, if you stubbornly refuse to do what you know that God wants you to do, there are no other remedies. There remaineth no more sacrifice for sin. That's what he says. If you refuse to do, that's willful disobedience. If we willfully sin after that we have received the knowledge of the truth, if you refuse to do what you know God wants you to do, there are no other remedies. God does not offer a plan B. God does not offer you multiple choice options on the issue of obedience. God is not going to compromise with you just like he refused to compromise with Pharaoh. God is not going to cut a deal with you just like he refused to cut a deal with Pharaoh. So what makes you think that you are bigger, better, smarter, or more powerful than Pharaoh? God is not going to give you more light until you obey the light that he has already given you. Don't push the wire. Don't stretch the envelope. Don't try to hang one hairy little toe over the line to see if you can get away with it. Eventually, the patience of God comes to an end. God plays no favorites. I hope this is plain enough, folks. I'm trying to make it really plain so nobody can complain. I didn't understand what the pastor said. It was, it was too difficult. God plays no favorites. Eventually, you will reach the point of no return. It happened to Pharaoh. It happened later to the Jews. What makes you think it will not happen to you? We've just seen that Exodus 12:26 assumes and states, when our children will be internally prompted to ask us as their parents for wisdom and guidance when we ourselves are obeying God. Don't miss that point. If you're not obeying, your children won't get it. That's why we must obey with precision. Remember, we're talking about precise obedience. We're going to see a really great illustration of that in the text today and, and some things that God blessed them with because they precisely obeyed. You see, our children are watching us. Our children are questioning as they build their own framework for life. You are going to give account to God for the way that you are setting the example for your children and grandchildren and any other young people that you're influencing. Let me hammer another point home again that you're already tired of listening to me preach. We've already seen that proper obedience and service produces worship. That's the correct response for all doctrinal teaching, biblical discipline, and God-fearing example. Proper obedience and service produces worship. Do you understand worship? Do you understand worship? Is that the guys up on the stage all in blue jeans and cutaways and crooning into microphones and waving their hands while the strobe lights flash and the drums pound and the big guitars wail and wail and wail and wail. Praise and worship! Is that what that is? Do you understand worship?
Have you taught your children and grandchildren what it means to worship God in a way that is pleasing to Him and not merely stimulating to your flesh? Have you taught your children and grandchildren that appropriate worship includes being on time for church and not skipping church for any reason of inconvenience? Have you taught your children and grandchildren that being habitually late disrupts the worship of others? Have you taught them that missing church for your own convenience teaches them that the worship of God is not a priority? Houston, we have a problem here. Doctrine truly believed always results in a changed life. If you really believe that we worship the sovereign God of the universe and that you are nothing more than a gnat whom he can squash out at any moment he pleases. You will be on the right road to worship. Last week we looked at the New Testament application of that principle in Romans 12. We looked at specific ways that teaching it, believing it, and obeying it does at least three things in your life. Number one, it transforms, that it is metamorphosizes your life. That's the word that Paul uses there in Romans 12, metamorphosis. It metamorphosizes your life. Number two, it instructs your life in the exercise of your spiritual gifts, which is what that chapter is mostly about, to the edifying of the church and the gaining of spiritual rewards, which you will not get. You will cry someday in heaven. Did you know there are tears in heaven? There are tears in heaven. They don't get wiped away until the very end, when we've been through and seen all the rewards that we missed things going up in flames according to 1 Corinthians chapter 3 you're going to cry in heaven folks so am I there are going to be things that I look at and say if I had only made a different decision there and it would have been so easy and now it looks like why in the world did I ever make the stupid decision that I made at that point and it's gone Do you take God's word seriously? It's going to happen, folks. We're talking reality. Divine reality. Real people. Real location. Real place. And Jesus Christ standing there and talking to you personally. Are you ready? Number three, it makes a lasting impact on the surrounding world for the glory of Christ. We're going to get up there and be sad because we're going to discover that there's some things that we could have done that would have made an impact for Christ. We didn't do it. Now, God still accomplished his purpose because he's sovereign, but we got left out of the process. We saw that there are some requirements. The transformation, that life reconstruction, and the impact is not a freebie. We look briefly at what is required of you. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. If you don't start there, you'll never get anywhere. You have to make that once and for all time, giving of your body to God as living, holy, acceptable sacrifice. You will never grow from spiritual infancy to spiritual maturity until you do that. In practical terms, that means giving your body to him in all the things that you use for excuses for not doing his will. And we listed a whole bunch of those last week. God wants you and takes you as you are. It's not your job to clean up yourself first, to make yourself healthy and well first, to give yourself a lot of money first. It's your job to come to him as you are, both for salvation and also for your spiritual growth. Don't use your weakness, sickness, pimples, halitosis, and B.O. as an excuse for not obeying him now. Don't try to control your own life. Ask him, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? That's the question that Paul asked on the road to Damascus. And look how God used Paul. Remember our message last week was talking about dead meat everywhere, and that includes dead meat in the church. When there's enough dead meat in a church, the church dies. And they don't just die for liberalism and apostasy. They die like solid Bible-believing churches at Ephesus, the first church that Jesus talked to in Revelation who had lost their first love. Jesus said he would kill their churches if they didn't repent. You know, folks, the church at Ephesus is dead today. I have walked the streets of ancient Ephesus. The church of Ephesus in the book of Revelation 
is gone. Remember also some churches die for stubbornly insisting on their own personal pleasure, wealth, and prosperity like Laodicea. I gave the illustration of leprosy last week. The body dies a little piece at a time, and finally the body dies. We've been discussing bodies and sacrifice. Remember, that's what Paul is talking about in Romans 12, 2. Present your body a living sacrifice. In other words, don't let the world squeeze you into its mold. Develop the mind of Christ. We talked about the mind of Christ. The Christian mind starts with an entirely different set of premises, which is why there is such a thing as a Christian worldview. And look at all the times, and we talked about that, how many times Paul talks about thinking in Romans chapter 12. And then... Finally, we said, God placed you in this church because you are essential to the very survival of this church. Don't say, well, somebody else is more important. No, you are essential to the survival of this church. When you fail to function properly, you are murdering this church. When you fail to properly fit in and give your full, unwavering, fully committed service to this church, you are strangling this church and making other Christians here suffer for your own personal, selfish carnal reasons. You're not a member of yourself, Paul says so in Romans 12. You are, quote, every one members one of another. If you are a member here, do you attend all the services? If you are a member, do you give sacrificially, not just the bare minimum of the tithe? You've heard me preach on that before. The tithe was under the law. Christians today have so much more and ought to give so much more. If you're a member, do you attend the annual congregational meeting? That comes up in just a month, folks. Or do you irresponsibly shrug your shoulders with a careless attitude of somebody else can take care of that besides it's boring? How often do you really pray for this church, really wrestle in prayer for any extended time? How often do you fast for this church? Have you ever fasted in your life for spiritual reasons, not for dietary reasons, not because you're trying to lose weight? For spiritual reasons. You're part of the body. You're not on your own. God put you here to minister, not just to soak it up and feel good and then complain when things aren't going your way. Here at VPC, do we want to see dead meat everywhere? I close Romans 12 without comment, but as I read, I suggested to you that there, a question you should ask yourself is, how does this apply to me? I spent six months covering the spiritual gifts, so I'm not going to go over that now. I also gave you a list of seven other things that show up in this chapter, which I hope you will dig out for yourself. Maybe someday I'll preach them, maybe someday I won't, but I gave you the list. Romans 12 also includes all the spiritual motivations. Number two, all the spiritual attitudes. Number three, the spiritual actions. Number four, the spiritual results, if you can expect when functioning correctly. Number five, the spiritual responses, pleasing to God. Number six, the resulting spiritual deference. And number seven, the spiritual application of the chapter to the real world around us in which we live. Study Romans 12. So that brings us to what's your hat? What's your, here's your hat, what's your hurry? And I have five minutes to cover it. The passage teaches us, number one, what people should do in preparation for the judgment of God that is about to fall on any nation. What should you do? You say, well, I don't really think judgment is going to come here on the United States. Okay, that's fine. Go right ahead and think that. You'll wish you had done something about it in advance. This passage also tells us what the children of Israel failed to do in preparation and how God gave certain things to them in the Passover narrative to remind them about these failures so it wouldn't happen again when national judgment falls, as it's going to happen in the Great Tribulation period. Now, there are going to be some Jews who are prepared. I'm not going to get into all that today because that's very exciting, the topic, and it looks at a bunch of Old Testament passages, and it looks at Petra, and it looks at you know Jews fleeing into the wilderness in the book of Revelation. I mean, all kinds of really cool things. Some people are prepared. Some will be prepared. But what do we learn? First of all, we learn they took the food that they had. Hmm, food is a really good place to start. <laughs> and all of you are excited about that in just about five minutes. It says, and the people took their dough before it was leavened. You know, preparation for national disaster requires food. God didn't start providing manna that night. That didn't happen for a long time. After they were already across the Red Sea and into the wilderness a ways was when God started providing manna. They took the food they had. Second, it appears they really didn't expect the judgment to fall and deliverance to happen. There may be some folks in this audience today that think that, oh, the judgment really won't fall, uh, and if it does, deliverance will happen anyway, and I don't have to worry about it. No, 
what it says here is it says they had to take the dough, quote, before it was leavened. In other words, they hadn't really prepared even one day in advance for what was about to happen. They didn't even cook any bread ahead. After the first couple of plagues, the urgency of expectancy had faded. Because, see, once the plague started, Pharaoh says the people are way too lazy. And we're going to put more work on them. We're going we're to make their burden even greater. We're not going to let up on them. We're going to make it hard on these people. After the first couple of plagues, the urgency of expectancy had faded. The excited anticipation had turned into cynicism. They probably thought, yeah, God will send judgment, but it really won't change the status quo. I'll just keep on slogging along like before. You know, Pharaoh's a jerk, and he probably won't change. And no real need to get ready, even though God said to gird yourselves and hold the staff in your hand and eat with haste. It's probably just symbolic, probably just allegorical, mythological, symbolical, all that kind of stuff that other people think about the promises of God instead of saying God's promises are true and absolute and will be fulfilled exactly and precisely and to the word, to the letter, as he said they would be. They had the opinion that many in the reform camp today, unfortunately, have by saying it's all just allegorical, all that stuff about the future. Their people, it's going to happen. They probably thought, no big deal. Third, third thing we learn out of this passage. They not only took food, but they took the means for preparing the food. <laughs> Did you notice that in the text? It says they took their kneading troughs. If national disaster hit today, would you have any means to prepare food that didn't depend on public utilities? We've had a couple of big storms around here, knock things out, knock the electric out, knock some of the gas lines and water lines out. Could you prepare food if you didn't have public utilities? If you have a fireplace, and probably not in this area, at least not in the less expensive homes, have you split wood for cooking? Or do you just buy expensive cords of wood when you want to have a pretty fire and roast s'mores? Wow, you say, you have enough chocolate marshmallows to make s'mores. Okay, how much more s'mores are you going to eat? What portable means do you have for preparing food for yourself and your family if you had to flee for your life on a moment's notice? They put, put their means of preparing food in their backs. Fourth, they took clothing. Now, they didn't have a lot, though they got some more from the Egyptians later on in the passage, but they didn't have a lot. Verse 34 says that their kneading troughs were bound up in their clothes upon their shoulders. In other words, their clothing was basically a backpack. How much can you personally carry in a backpack, especially if it included a means of preparing food? Or do you have so much clothing that it would sink the Titanic? When you get ready to go somewhere, do you pack for days? Do you always fuss over which outfit to wear to impress people? If you had to run for your life, could you pack a sufficient and intelligent bag of clothing, food, cooking utensils, supplies, and necessities in five minutes or less? I'm talking practical people because these were real people. These were real people who lived. These were real people who were functioning as families and as a group. Sort of not a nation yet. They didn't get really to that until they got across the Red Sea. But, but they're functioning together sort of as a group. These were real people. This is what they really faced. Could you do it in five minutes or less? If you really believe that judgment is about to fall, do you already have your bags packed? Are you really prepared for a crisis? Or do you just shrug your shoulders and yawn? Yeah, it may happen someday, but I won't think about it until then. I mean, the preacher is like Chicken Little who thought the sky was falling. I'd much rather be like the ostrich who stuck his head in the sand, or the three little monkeys. Hear no evil, see no evil, think no evil. Do you personally have any idea what you would need in order to survive more than 24 hours outside of your home? Remember, folks, we're talking about real people, real history, 
real people just like you, real people who had families, real people some of whom were older, some of whom were just kids, real people just like you who had to pull on their pants and run for their lives. And they made it. And I think God's giving us some hints in this passage as to how they did it. Fifth, they obeyed the word of God through Moses exactly. It says so in the text. Does that ring any bells with what we've just been studying over the past umpteen weeks? If you want God's blessing, you obey him exactly as he has commanded. Now, here in this particular passage, don't count on this happening with you, but they got blessed financially. You see, they had an enforced multi-generational savings account with immediate withdrawal privileges in the event of a bank foreclosure. <laughs> in other words, what do I mean? They'd been slaves for 400 years. Ever since the death of Joseph, God was merely paying them for their own labor and the labor of their ancestors with compound interest. But their exact obedience made them rich. Verse 35, And the children of Israel did according to the word of Moses, and they borrowed of the Egyptians jewels of silver and jewels of gold and raiment. You know, one of the basic financial principles of the New Testament is being debt-free. The Jews were debt-free because they'd been slaves. But God blessed them with wealth from that point on, and they are still some of the wealthiest people on earth today, as you know, because on this night, on this one night, they obeyed him exactly in everything that he told them to do. You never know what obedience on one specific item or at one specific time will result in for yourself and for your descendants. One obedience. You don't know it in advance, but this one thing may be the key that opens doors for generations. Oh, I'm going to have to stop there. Our time is up. But I want to tell you where God specifically promised that obedience will last to a thousand generations. But we'll have to pick it up there next week. Dear Heavenly Father, again we thank you for your word and for its power. And its practicality. We can learn a lot if we put ourselves in the sandals of the Israelites. What would we have done if we'd been there? If we'd been an old man or an old lady, a dad or a mom, a boy or a girl, a single, what would we have done when all these things happened? How would we have responded? What can we learn from the way they responded? What can we learn from your generous hand and how you blessed immediate, exact, precise obedience to what you had specifically promised that would be fulfilled literally, accurately, and precisely? Father, teach us that we might teach our children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren and that it might pass on from generation to generation if our Lord tarries. Help us to know what to do to survive in times of national crisis. Not because we're afraid, but because we're wise and we see what your word has declared. Father, we commit these things to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Our closing hymn today, and I hope you apply it. In